Radio life and no TV. Millionaires stay greedy. No love and there's no grub. We got the homeless saying. Y'all better come my way. Y'all better come my way. Okay, and say. Y'all better come and my way. And welcome back to Jam Pack. Now, folks, I have a super awesome, dope guest with us today. He is an actor, a writer, and director. Uh, you may have seen his work. Spoiler alert, folks. I'm going to give spoiler alerts when I feel like you may need a spoiler alert. So spoiler alert. He's the writer, director, producer, actor of the Netflix acquired film through his company, Willful Productions, A New York Christmas Wedding. Um, the film is centered on a proposed uh, Christmas Eve wedding between Chris, uh, Jennifer Ortiz, played by Nia Fairweather, and David Wilkes, played by our guest. Uh, plans change when Jennifer is visited by the angel played by cooper koch i think coach koch um and shown and shown the life that she could have led uh, had she not denied her true feelings for her childhood friend gabby played by adriana de mayo um and the film i mentioned and this was also the film that i mentioned in the jam talk of episode 62 just in case y'all need a little refresher uh which is where he became the first Uh, That became his first uh, time being a writer and director for a feature film. Um, You may have also seen him in the film Stonewall as the pioneer activist and Stonewall legend, Marsha P. Johnson. Uh, The film is about the 1969 Stonewall riots, the violent clash that kicked off the the gay rights movement in New York City. Uh, The drama centers on Danny Winters, who flees to New York, uh, leaving his sister, uh, leaving behind his sister. He finds his way to the Stonewall Inn where he meets Trevor before catching the eye of Ed Murphy, uh, manager of the Stonewall. And he concludes with, uh, he can, colludes with the corrupt police and exploits the homeless youth. Now, for y'all not familiar with the Stonewall riots, on June 28th, 1969, the uprising at the Stonewall Inn, a bar in New York City, was a pivotal marker in the beginning of the LGBTQ plus rights movement in the U.S. after experiencing police brutality simply for congregating. uh, LGBTQ patrons decided to take a stand and fight back against the brutal intimidation they faced regularly. Uh, Stonewall was the most visible incidents of police brutality against the community, but it was a part of a pattern of law enforcement targeting LGBTQ plus folks uh, without cause. Uh, So the Stone Riots, the Stonewall Riots were a crucial act of resistance of the LGBTQ community. And and right in the thick of it was his character, Marsha P. Johnson, the Rosa Parks of the LGBTQ plus movement. The reason why we celebrate Pride every month, y'all. So so some reports uh, indicate that she threw the first brick that led to the uprising, uh, and there's no disputing her role in the fight for equality. Um, and you may have also seen his work um, in the film The Humbling uh, with Al Pacino or in his uh, first network primetime job, NBC's The Blacklist, uh, season one, as well as the season finale. Uh, and then some of his other credits include Marvel's Netflix, The Defenders, directed by S.J. Clarkson, acting opposite Kristen Ritter, uh, co-creator, producer, and star of the New York Television Festival's official selection, Harlem Nights. Y'all, if you're not as excited as I am right now, (laughs) and the 2018 short film Jitters available on Amazon Prime, so make sure you get that. Uh, He was also, he wrote, he directed, and produced, and starred in that film. Uh, Standing at six, three and a half, y'all, he also played Division I basketball at St. John's University. His roots hail from Nigeria, but joining us from New York, folks, I bring to y'all a Toje, a bit. Woo! Well, Jamila, that was absolutely amazing. And I want to meet the person that you just introduced. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you just sitting, uh, sitting up, like looking around, like who, who is she talking about right now? <laughs> right it's, it's supposed to sound like they've done the work, you know. Right. You've been <laughs> out here, out here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's out here for for sure. And um, yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's you know it's exciting to have a film, but it's also it's great to kind of look back at. It's still very early in my career, but to, but to look back at the work that's been done that. Will always transfer on 
with everything I do in the future. So, you know, it, it's, it's really good to kind of, you meet someone, someone says, Hey, you're an actor. It's like, yeah, I'm an actor. They say, what have you done? And yeah. I can't take the three minutes you just did to, to, to introduce myself to them. <laughs> so I'm after to refer them to Jam Pack so they kind of see yeah. what I did and believe I'm an actor, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They'll be like, okay, I guess so. I guess yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, well, you you've done, you done absolutely. Thank you for agreeing to to join the conversation and to be on the sure. show. This is This is amazing. This is awesome. Thank you. This thank is, you. Thank you. This is such a treat, especially since... You know, my wife and I, we both um, watched the show together and spoiler alert, we cried. <laughs> we cried. Oh, we were feeling emotional. Uh, we were on a roller coaster. And then I love doing a deep dive, but then I did a deep dive on you and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like he's, <laughs> he was Marsha P. Johnson. He had his yeah. film Jitters. And you've contributed so much as an ally to the LGBTQ plus uh, community just in your artwork alone um, and, and you continue and you're just getting warmed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, you for know? saying that. It's very interesting because I, it's when I first did Stonewall, I was very uh, excited, proud um, to play the pioneer, the legend of Marsha P. Johnson. And I, I, ironically didn't know about her growing up because in growing up in New York city in schools, we were, we were taught black rights, but we weren't mm -hmm. taught gay rights. You know, we weren't taught black rights and Marsha P. Johnson transcends all rights to your point before where, when people celebrate pride for the month mm -hmm. of pride in June and people are in, in having these parades and celebrations it's because of Marsha P. Johnson, a black woman. Yeah. And it's really important for me when I did my research on her to realize she walked the streets that I walk, but I never got to know about her until this type of film. And I mm -hmm. think to experience that was very, very exciting. And then to have the type of outlook in my life and the research, it changed how I saw things a lot. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a straight man. I'm an ally 100%. But in that sense, I saw a different lens of different stories to be told that haven't been told, have been told because of the fact that people aren't telling them I and mean, basically to have a film that's a christmas film that's having your first your first type of uh diverse queer storyline in a christmas film is 2020 it was 2020 why am i an independent filmmaker the first one to do that but i'll take that and i did so it's I, I'm, by, by the way folks i'm trying not to say the title of the film because jamil is trying to get me <laughs> Well, you know. we actually, we, well, let's, we'll, <laughs> well, in, in that case, I should be drinking a lot more than what I've already been there drinking. There we go. But, I'm, I'm looking at my whole but, thing, honest. <laughs> but we haven't, we, I haven't, um, I haven't established the games that we're playing yet, but that okay. does lead me to a good point. Your drink of choice was actually beer, um, an ale. Um, so yes. I love the Allagash collection of beers. So you've got an Allagash white. Um, and yeah, and then I've got the Allagash Curio, um, and Allagash will kind of, will really get you there. So I apologize if halfway we're through this and I'm already <laughs> slurring words, but, uh, but this Still is, can't. this Still can't for sure. Right, exactly. And be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you'll really hear my terrible New York accent come out. <laughs> I love accents. So, I mean, you know, the fact that you grew up in New York, um, you know, I yeah. definitely want to talk about that. I want to get to that. Um, but also with a little bit of order of business. So we've got your drink of choice. Um, and the games that we're going to play today are keywords and story time. So yes. the keywords today, which is going to be very tricky, I feel like, um, are New York, wedding, and jitters. If y'all listen to the intro, that's really, <laughs> those words are going to be really difficult to stay away from. <laughs> it's, hard, it's, it's hard because I think there's, there's a part of me that's going to be smart. And then after a while, I'm, I'm going to say like, fuck it let me be prideful and say the name over and over and over again because i love the names of these films but exactly I'll get there. I'll get there. it's all good so when if we do um use one of the keywords we both have to take um a drink um so so we're we're both gonna get there together this is it <laughs> 
But, um, you know, going to kind of your, your New York, your New York roots um in a sense and i and i do want to also get back to um you know your work with stonewall and uh you know playing marsha p johnson i i'm as you can see i'm very excited i have like a bunch of questions coming from every direction of my brain um but your but your upbringing was about scholastics and sports um with immigrant parents from nigeria um you were born in the states in new york um, and when you graduated uh, from St. John's University in 2008, um, when the economy was going down, you had a good friend. Um, you had a friend give you great advice saying it's going to be hard to find a job. Uh, so what what do you want to do with your life? It's not a financial thing. It's something that that gets you up and moving every single day. Um, and it was the arts. So you pursued your arts and acting. What did that mean to you to get those kind of gems, those words of wisdom from from a friend, especially during a time with the economy kind of going all over the place? Yeah, it, 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 and and thank you. I I, I see. <laughs> I, I can. I was gonna say it better than you said it, but you said it more <laughs> quicker. So he said it perfectly because I was in the same <laughs> thing about my friend this and that. But it, it it for me definitely definitely was an opportunity where people always talk about. Where do you go for your information? You go to your parents, you go to the internet for some people now, they go to the Kardashians, who knows? But um, for me, it was really important to go to an ally, a friend who knew me, who's a smart person, same age. And I just, I like to talk to people and see where they, how they, how, what, what, what's their outlook and perspective on life. And this friend, he said, you have 40 years of your life to work, do what you want to do right now. And I always want, I always want to pursue the arts, but the problem, the problem was for me is that I never had that outlet being, being from the city. I never had that type of regional theater, that type of um, after school uh, commercial showdown, things like that. I never had that type of experience only at sports and in, in, in the city, you just really, you're forced outside of your house. You go play sports with your friends at a blacktop and then you come back home, do some homework, wake up, do it again. So to think about developing characters and developing stories and seeing a film on TV or a TV show, thinking that you could be a part of that somehow, it was hard to kind of envision that. And when I had that advice to my friend, I really kind of looked to myself, which I think a lot of people are doing right now during this pandemic. You know, they, they say for our generation, we went through a lot of stuff going from the 80s to the 90s to the millennium to here and now. But there's a lot of people who are seniors in high school or college and they're graduating virtually or they're going into a world where there's no jobs, that people left their jobs after 25 plus years. So what kind of job are they getting into for the future? And I think it's very, it mirrors what I experienced where what do you want to do now? You know, you have you have a whole year literally because of the pandemic to kind of figure out what you want to do with your life. That's not something that is being forced upon you because a lot of a lot of people prepared for a future in scholastics or prepare for a future in whatever type of job or career, but something happens that's outside of their capability and from that it's gone. So um yeah for me when when he said that to me I just really took it in and realized I wanted to pursue acting and I started from the bottom up and just kept on going in nice. New York City. Yeah in New York ah New York New York New York <laughs> we're both drinking there you go. <laughs> <laughs> when you would practice, you know, acting in repetition with your sister, Brooklyn was a place of imagination um, growing up in the city. But how has growing up in New York <laughs> um, continued to inspire your creative nature to this day? Yeah, it, it's it's just being able to step outside. And I, I would say look at characters, but I don't want to be judgmental to people who live in the city. I, I think there's a lot of people who walk around the streets of NY and they really feel as if they are, they're real people basically. And there's real people all over in different type of uh, neighborhoods and different type of states and things like that. But in this city, more specifically, you have people who come here because they want to experience a different, they want to be free here. And think about what happens and I'll probably parallel this a lot to Stonewall, but people they they would say that if you were gay outside of the city in the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, the 80s, you would come here because here is where everyone's able to be themselves. You know, everyone's ever be free. Everyone's ever able to be 
loved in a way, you know, so I, I feel here in the city, you see people who are just unapologetically themselves. And I think for me walking around and you, you, you can watch things like that in films or maybe TV shows. You see different characters, different people, different situations. But in this city, you see you see some things if you keep your eyes open. That's the whole thing. Some people have their phones, their heads into their phones, looking at the floor. But if you keep your eye open, also if you're open to people, communication and talking to people, you can, you can really be, be, not even experiencing things. You can, you can really be amazed by the type of personalities and type of com communications or connections you could have. And I think because of our film, when we have Jennifer, when she meets Azriel in this city block and they walk and talk, a lot of people have their comments about, you know, Jennifer, what are you doing? You, you can't talk to a stranger. And a lot of people understand that, but there's sometimes in, in this city where you could talk to someone knowing that you will never see them again and have a really deep connection because there's no pressure. And I think people from the city know what that feels like. And people who, not even from the city, but people who are open to wanting more in their life rather than their own close shelter way, definitely know that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you, you filmed the stone wall in the actual stone wall. How yeah. was, how was that? I mean, that's such a historical space. Actually, we, we, we filmed it in Montreal, Canada, but they, mm. They uh, <laughs> they recreated <laughs> the stone the Stonewall Inn, Christopher Street. They recreated a whole block. I mean, I was amazed. This was, was, was my first major. It was an independent film, but it was a budget of about a. Uh, I think it was budget was about um. I would say about uh, twenty five million dollars, maybe something like that. Oh, twenty million dollars. So it, it was a first, my first really major major type of film, but it was still an independent film because our director Roland, Roland Emmerich. You know, he's done films that are blockbuster films that are $100 million plus, And still to this day, he's doing that. So to him, this $20 million film is a small little bit, small independent film. And I would say, Roland, you know, if you're watching, my independent <laughs> films are really small, small, small <laughs> independent film. Um, but um, so we were able to recreate the Stonewall in Christopher Street in the airport hangar in Montreal, Canada. And that was the first time where I saw the attention to detail that our production designers had where I've walked around New York city my whole life and to see in Canada, a whole city block, you mm -hmm. know, really, really created to the T you could walk into stores, you could open up um, townhouse windows. It was really amazing to see how far, what, what people, why people fall in love with film because you're seeing a, a true world on, on camera. And for me as a fan of cinema to be a part of it as an actor and kind of just experience what it's like, how people at that level, for me, it was amazing. So yeah, so we didn't film in Stonewall. I went to Stonewall to do my research, but having to create the Stonewall, having to uh, film on set, being the Stonewall Inn, it felt like we we're right back there in the 60s because we wanted to film in New York City, but because the whole, um, it would have been problematic with the modern day look. We're filming the 60s, we're filming a 60s film rather than a film in 20, at the time, 2014. So it was really important that we kind of were left alone to create our own little world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, what did it mean for you to play Marsha P. Johnson um, in the film Stonewall? You know, I know that you felt some similarities with, with her and um, you know, how, what were some of those similarities where you felt connected to, to her? Yeah. When I, when I first, I saw a breakdown from Marsha and it talked about her being a mother figure to her peers talked about her being, I mean, the description was because of the, what people hear is that, you know, she's black. She's uh she's someone who they had her boots and they had all these different things. And I, and I very energetic, very positive. And to the core, I know that that is me. And then I had my manager at the time kind of submit me then the casting director emailed my manager back and said, hey, make sure ToJ looks her up because it's a real person, you know, rather than try to create some character out of nowhere. And when I looked her up, I realized, oh, my gosh, I look a lot like her because she's beautiful. <laughs> but I, <Yeah. laughs> but I, I just realized that. I just realized I look a lot like her. Let me, do, let me just deep, deep dive into more about her. And I realized that Marsha at that time, even her whole life, 
you know, we're dealing with black rights of the black the the black rights movement there. We're dealing with gay rights movement there. We're dealing with the idea like New York City, the grittiness of it all. And I, I you know, Marsha was someone who was black, someone who was queer, but also someone who, on top of that, she was a drag queen. So she was never someone. She was not never, but she had to be stronger than most than most people because of the fact that she was a drag queen. So she couldn't. People looked at her as a regal way, as they do with drag queens. Mm-hmm. And this is a time where. Marsha, the young kids in Christopher Street would go to her for, for me, what I felt was type of like a boost of energy. They go to her as a mother figure because Marsha knew everyone. Marsha, if Marsha had a dollar, if Marsha had four dollars in her pocket, four kids came up to her, she'll give them each a dollar <clears throat> and would walk home with nothing. That's who she was. And I had that similarities too because I care about my friends, I care about people. So I just knew when I did my research that me, Marsha, and I. The similarities were there, the similarities of people. I mean, I grew up in New York City as a black man and as a black man, even still to this day, people across the street because I'm tall and I'm black. And, and you know, there's no type of hidden secret there, but I know what that feels like. Yeah. So when I, when I, we filmed in Montreal, Canada, I remember going to a restaurant by myself because the hard part about filming as an actor, you know, you are alone a lot. But I remember sitting down, I had my eyebrows done because I was playing Marsh in the 60s. I had a uh, big hair. I had nail polish on my nails, but all scraped. And I remember sitting down at a bar and usually people are nice to me and things like that. But in Canada, people would just look at me and look away. And I, and I was wondering why, why would that was until I realized what, what I look like. I mean, I know who I am, but when I realized what I look like, I realized, okay, I get it now. And that's when I started opening my eyes to the idea of, you can't judge someone by their appearance at all because in the end, you don't know what their heart is like. Because mm-hmm. Marsha had a great heart. I have a great heart. And you don't know what, you don't know what their story is as well too. So for me, the similarity between Marsha and I is just something that to our core or to my core to, to relate to her, she's someone that wanted better from a lot of people. Also someone who's, who, who was fucking feisty, who would fight for what she believes in. And I think more than anything, that was the best best thing about playing Marsha is that, yeah, there's a great side to her, but Marsha would fucking fight to the death for those who she loves. And I take that to the grave. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, for folks that are a little bit conflicted with, you know, the way that Stonewall was told in that film, um, you know, on a mainstream platform, what would you tell them or what would you say to them? Because it was almost this it was more focused on Danny Winters, this, this white yeah. male, when it was these people that have been in the trenches of, of yeah. the movement from the very beginning, you know, what would you, what would you say to them? Yeah, I, I would definitely tell them that I, I understand why they would think that. And I also understand that the film was made with the intention of rolling to someone who is, he's deeply, deeply involved with, the support of the the gay youth, basically. You know, he he. I remember talking to him, and he was just heartbroken that about I think the the high the majority the high percentage of kids who were gay when they're younger at the time were homeless because of the fact of like they had to run away from home because they weren't accepted. So to my point before, they'll leave home and go to New York City because. If I'm going to be, if my family kicked me out of my house in Kansas, I'm going to go where I'm going to be accepted and loved. And mm-hmm. Roland, as he did some, he was part of the LGBT center in LA. He was just someone who was just kind of really, he just wanted to explore that story. And the idea that he really believes, and you'll ask him if you could get him on the show and have some wine with him. He'll love that. But Oh, yeah. Really, Let him yeah. know. I'm so down. I'm so down. I would love that. But Roland really believes that movements are happening in the world by young people. You know, and um, he really believed that this was a major movement that happened. He's really inspired by the young people, the 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 the, the young queer, the the young queer people who were thrown out of their homes but still wanted to make a life for themselves. And you know, he he's someone who the hard part with him is that his attention was totally correct. He got the right actors. A lot of people felt as if they should have cast, even for, for my part, cast someone who was trans. But Marsha B. Johnson at that time was not trans, was a drag queen. You know, mm-hmm. was, that, that wasn't happening at the time. Yeah. But and he stood by the fact that, you know, we cast the best actor. And that was unknown too, mind you. And a lot of people when at first when I they're like, you play Marsha? I'm like, yeah, they're like, oh my gosh, because to some people who knew Marsha before the whole 
popularity of the film, it's like Marsha P. Johnson is queen, you know, she's yeah. queen to this movement. Yeah. And I never took that lightly. I, I mean, I was, I was very fearful at first when I got the part. So I'm like, oh, wow, I, may, I got the role. I'm going to be Marsha. Then I'm like, oh, shit, I have to perform this. How do I do yeah. this? <laughs> you yeah. know, and I had, I had a really, I had really good friends that kind of supported what, what they knew my fear, but they also didn't let that fear debilitate me because they wanted me to go out there and not even just act because that's such, such like a, a broad term, but go out there and, re, and recreate her and make her be alive on screen. That was my main intention, to have someone who knew Marsha to go watch our film. Granted, they want to see the Stonewall Rides, but they, if they see Marsha, they'll see her alive one more time for about an hour in this film. And I think more than anything, people could do that. That's a success. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, in, in storytelling, uh, you've, you've really taken that on. And, and I love that you are so genuine and so connected with, um, you know, wanting to tell the queer experience, but being adamant on, you know, never wanting to be an ally saying this is the actual queer experience. Um, was that a challenge trying to stay true to your mission to share the story as an ally in the creative process, especially collaborating with other folks when it comes to jitters and a New York Christmas wedding? So I think that's like three jigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, it's, it's interesting because I, I think the similarities in the way I want to tell my stories in a way the world is, is that I, I'm someone who grew up in a household of Nigerian parents and I had American friends in New York City. So I, I was in school with people who were Chinese, Chinese, Asian, um, um, Native American, not Native American. I mean, probably one or two, but you got me all confused. <laughs> yeah. uh, New York is different. Uh, Hispanic, New York. <laughs> you know, Russia, not a lot of different people. So I grew up in a school, a lot of different people. So I was able to kind of, I never, I didn't see race as something where it's kind of like, you are this, so don't talk to me because I don't know what you're like. I mean, I had friends from all different type of races and genders even growing up. So um, to have an opportunity to tell a story, and I knew as an independent filmmaker for my first type of film, if you switch things on people, especially looking at me as a six foot four, a six four, tall, decently handsome African American man, hey, you know, you, you expect hey. me. <laughs> <laughs> You expect, me to play like a role. Yeah. <laughs> you expect me to play a role of like a, a tall security guard, a tall athlete. And, you know, I, I, I'm someone who's a little bit more emotional. I grew up that way. And to show that emotional side of a black male, a lot of people are really surprised to see that. And I think for Jitters, the best thing about it was the fact to really show people that you might think you know someone by looking at them, like I said before. But if you really, and I love the idea of this film and being an intimate moment, I love intimate things. If you really spend time with someone in a room and really hear what they're saying and you're with them for that type of amount of time, you really get to know them. And that's what I love about our short film is that you're able to kind of get to know this one character named Michael, his fears about not even getting married, but his fears about leaving behind those of those in the past. And when you see the film, you understand why he's going through what he's going through. And then when I wrote the script and I had my producer, Ian Phillips, saw it, he was telling me like, this is your first script and it's, it's really it's really interesting. He loved it, but it's interesting that for people's first script that they write, they usually write something that's all funny and comedic for their friends to laugh at and have a good time. But it's a rarity someone's first story is so um, introspective or even mature, basically. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're saying things that people can reflect on or people could relate to that are 40 years over your age, but it's universal in that sense. And when I did did that film and we filmed that people loved it, I knew I was onto something. And the best thing about that film is that it's not about the character being gay. It's not about that at all. It's all about the character talking about love. Mm -hmm. And I think from there on then, I went to really explore that in my storytelling because I think the evolution of gay cinema, and I'm, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not the one to drive it, I can only add to it, is right. making films that are not making these broad statements of of the fight for, for, for gay rights. I mean, that, that we could have that, we're gonna have that, Hollywood would do that. And you see when Hollywood does it, and people either like it or not, but they, they come with very, they come very strict about what they expect to see. But the more you see stories that are just 
about people who are who they are, but just experiencing experience things that people experience. I think that's where we that's where we want to get to. We want to see a man or a woman experience something and then them being gay or queer, that's something of an afterthought rather. I mean, I mean that's something they're proud of 100 percent But that's not what we're that's not what we're fighting for in the storytelling. That would take about 40 pages, but let's get to the point of what really means to this person right now. Because there's a lot of people here in 2020 that have done that fight already. A lot of people love our our wedding film and what well, said wedding. There you go. Hey, oh, I was so <laughs> I was so in the story. I was like, oh shit, okay. I didn't say that. A lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people love our film and they love it because we don't label Jennifer at all. You know, she's bisexual, she's pansexual, she's what? I mean, it doesn't matter to me what she is. She's someone who's torn between love, and I think that's the way I want to tell stories because. A lot of people who, when I did Stonewall, and I was kind of fearful in, in early on because people were like, okay, you're playing Marsha. What's your deal? Who are you married to? Who's this? Who's that? Mm-hmm. But as an actor, you kind of learn, it, you know, you put that all on screen. But now we have social media and everything like that. It's totally different. So I don't know. For me, labels are, they're necessary. But I think in storytelling for the future, but I want to tell because I'm an ally in the storytelling. I just want to put mm-hmm. everything on screen where you see characters for who they are. And some people feel like, who am I? Who am I as a cisgender male to tell these stories? And I totally understand that. And I, I flip it back to them. And, and who are you as someone who's part of the community that, to not tell the stories? Right. That part. But I love <laughs> yeah. that you're really doing your part as an ally. And, you know, I want to get to that as well. Um, but, yeah. you know, if, for folks that haven't put it together, put it together. See, that's where the slurring begins. Um, Jitters is, and I'll drink to that, um, is an LGBTQ plus film. It is a short film. It's in 14 minutes and it's on Amazon Prime. If y'all have not watched it, have not uh, picked it up on in the intro, make sure you watch it. It's a beautiful film. But what inspired the storyline and how difficult was it to keep it at 14 minutes? Because there is a, it is a wedding in a church, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and that was like the prelude to a New York Christmas wedding. What 100%. inspired that yeah. storyline? Well, um, I wrote a feature film. Uh, I worked on Broadway a little bit, <laughs> I the Broadway. Yeah. And, uh, and during that time, while, I was working on the working on working on the stage, and I was assistant director. And around these great actors, Chris Nope, Jason Patrick, Jim Gaffigan, Kiefer Sutherland, and Brian Cox, I was their little brother. But they're on stage, and while they performed, I was always backstage, just waiting for the two and a half hours to go by, so we could all go out and have dinner. You know, so <laughs> after mm-hmm. all working at this high level with these great actors, I started realizing, let me explore writing. And I wrote my first feature film during that time, and I liked it. I'm still trying to push that. And then someone said, you know, you're a first time writer. No one's going to give you money for a feature film because they don't know what you can do. And I thought, you know, but I worked on Broadway. I could do, every, I could do it all. But they're like, no, you know, <laughs> you have to see what you can do. <laughs> so then um, I decided, okay, let me do a short film. Because at the time, short films were getting more popular, more popular in the sense of like getting put on because now you had these film festivals that you could win you could win Oscars for short films. And, uh, and, I, and I, I, I'm someone who really believed that my short film should have not won an Oscar, but I, I really believe that it was, so, it was something that was so unexpected that it was done in a way that it was, I, I feel, I feel, I'm, I mean, again, I'm, I'm very proud of what, I, what, what we did. I feel it's something that it's like, this is something that you don't see. And if you really take in and be surprised by the story and follow the story, this is different. You know, and um, so I wanted to write a film and basically the film had to be something where it was personal to me at the time, because that's how something is very good when it's personal. And a lot of friends of mine were getting married at the time. And I would always think about weddings and think about the idea of what about and I've been a part of weddings and I had a, 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 I was a groomsman and, you know, we were in a back room celebrating for the, the groom and he's like, Oh, he has some shots, have some shots. Oh, my last time, my last time we're gonna yell. Oh, I'm not gonna be a single man anymore. It's all funny and they're all ticket shots. Everyone's laughing, talking about sports on their wedding day. Like who the fuck cares? <laughs> but um um and I and I always sit there thinking <laughs> I wanna, I, don't you think this you you're getting you're getting married, which is great, but 
what about what about the girlfriend that you dated for like three years in college? You said you loved her and you wanted to marry. What about that person? And I thought about that while everyone else all talked about like Kobe LeBron, you know. <laughs> but um, I realized then it's like okay, maybe I'm a little bit too introspective. But there must be other men out there that think how I think because women do. That's why women have they have women have cold feet. Now women that's not why they have cold feet, but we have films about women having cold feet and things like that because of mm-hmm. the idea like is this the is, is this the right person? But on the flip side, we have men just doing what the woman wants or men just basically getting drunk and getting down the aisle. So I wanted to show a film. I want to explore the idea of like what if a man is being emotional and then now on the flip side, if you have a gender swap more or less. Because my character, if it was in some type of, if you had to basically put it, I would be the bride and and um, Walker here, the beautiful actor who played um, Blake, he would be the groom. Because in the beginning of the film, they see it, you know, he's waiting there, what's going on, he comes to the back, it's like me. But because of the fact, and this is the whole thing, like, you know, gender thing, because I'm wearing a suit rather than wearing a, a, bride's, a, a, a bride's dress, Mm-hmm. A wedding gown, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One of those <Yeah>. things. <laughs> <laughs> but because I'm wearing that, yeah, people looked at people looked at both of us as if we are just two men in the back room of a church, you know. And and I and I and I thought while writing it, if people could follow that and follow what we're saying, because what is because these are just two people talking. Either you follow you follow this or you don't. And one of the some really good feedback I got from someone that she was a woman in her 40s. She said, you know, I saw your film and I loved it, but I'm fucking mad at myself because I saw two men in the back of a church before a wedding and not once did I think you two were getting married. And it says something more about her because in 2018 at the time, why did I never think that these two men could get married? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Why did it never cross my mind? And I think it doesn't cross people's minds mind at the time because you don't see enough of it basically you know yeah and i think that when we had that i realized okay this is this is this is something and i wanted to explore the ideas of just weddings weddings but weddings from my point my point of view what really how how it hits me and then you know when people saw the film there were people very very emotional because of the sentiment and people are emotional because they some people who were catholic never got to see a gay wedding in a church in the short film. And Mm -hmm. they were just really amazed. One, how did you do that? And then two, it's just like, it just seems so normal. And that's Mm -hmm. that's what they loved about the film. It seems so normal. And yet I never thought I could see something like that. I've I've never seen something like that. And I, and I knew then is that as an independent filmmaker, you want to create and do things that people have never seen before, because that's how you stand out. So we did yeah. that, and then we had a produ- production company about a year later after after Jitters. I'll just say it because mm-hmm. I'm proud. <laughs> we proud out here. Yeah, after we hit some <laughs> festivals, this production company, Kagama Media, saw the film and they said, "You know, we 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 loved your short, and we 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 if, we, if you could do something like this for Christmas, you know, we'll we'll help fund your first film." and as a filmmaker, if someone says they'll help you make your first film, you you jump on board right away, and that's what happened. And they wanted four things: they wanted New York City, they wanted a wedding in the church, they wanted Christmas, and they wanted a same-sex couple. And because of that, I wanted to explore Jitters more, but Jitters only worked as a short film only. Mm-hmm. To expand Jitters' storylines into like a big feature type of narrative, it wouldn't work because the immediacy of it being 14 minutes and he, he's in the back, make a decision. Do I go down? Do I not? That's what makes the film work. When you expand that, it could work, but that's, it's not what, what Jitters was for me. And Jitters, I want to kind of expand more into something bigger. So I wanted to kind of keep that very, very personal. So I wrote something totally different, switch agendas because I wanted to kind of see what it was like to have it from a female's point of view. Now, what is her type of Jitters like? Um, <laughs> So we had that. And I think to, to um, answer your point about the um, having a short film for 14 minutes, it was hard. People said you should have something around 10 or 12 because that's what film festivals like. But on Vimeo, we have a version that's a, that, that's a 12, 1237 and it takes out the prom scene. And oh people gosh. out there, people <laughs> out there, you must understand, you guys can understand this. <laughs> Literally. To cut a minute out of a short film is like cutting cutting off an arm because mm-hmm. 
you might think it's, it's a short film. What's a big deal? What's another minute? But people just tune out. And I, and I learned that from the short film. And the film is stronger 1230 because you get what you get. But I love the Amazon version because I call it the director's cut because you see that prompts and you see Michael, the character that I play, you see him really explaining why he thought like, you know, I love you and I did this for you. Why don't you love me? And she's kind of like, what? You know, it's like, no, I, yeah. I you, you know, no. And um, <laughs> it's really, it's, I, I know it's, it's really, you get the whole story more or less a little bit. I, yeah, that was, I, wow. As you were speaking, I had like five different questions shoot out of me well, at once, yeah. but uh, do you find that there's almost this, difference in reaction or how people feel when you change the sex when it's women with women or men with men I've always found that to be so interesting of you know maybe in mainstream media it's like it might be okay for two girls or maybe two guys but then you go to a destination you go to a place then it's okay two girls I'll accept it but two guys no way you know did you ever like experience that at any point in switching or shifting shifting gears a little bit that that was the best thing about taking jitters all over the nation for film festivals because you got to see people react and i remember i had i had someone at a major festival say we didn't get into their festival they said you know we loved your film we loved your title but i just feel like it was a new york city festival i just feel like in new york and l.a we've seen the story before, but she's very, she should be very interested to see how it plays in middle America because she felt like the whole thing is just like a, a twist ending. And basically the film is just, you're just doing a whole film for a twist. I'm like, that's not what the film is made for, but I understand why you're saying that because you see 3000 short films and you have to figure out what it means to you in the first minute, because you want to be able to turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. You know what I mean? So I get that, mm-hmm. but that wasn't what the film was made for, but I took the film all over. I remember going to Dubuque, Iowa, a film festival. And uh, I, <laughs> I always go and I always, ask, I always ask people, when did you realize that they were a couple? And then there was someone in Dubuque, Iowa. I mean, it was definitely, definitely a, a audience out there who they said, you know, I knew, I knew right away. I said, how did you know? She said, because they were dressed too well. They were dressed too well. They had to be gay. And I was like, <laughs> You know, but but <laughs> you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. But um, oh my gosh! With that, with that said, sw- switching genders. I think it was. I think because because of how we did it, and I always wanted this. And I wanted this with our with the uh, near Christmas wedding. Is that the more you follow the story, and you're not getting caught up about it being a queer story or not, the better it will be. And that's why my whole thing about not labeling not labeling these films. Because there was some film festival that said, you know, in the LGBTQ section, here's our film. And I'm like, fuck. I mean, I understand why you're doing that because it's for a specific audience. But our film would be stronger if people are seeing it, thinking it's a bride or it'll be stronger seeing it and realizing that it's not about that they're getting married. It's about showing love. It's about showing a couple that people... People who are only... People who are afraid to see LGBTQ stories because of what they fear... Mm-hmm. They're going to miss something of just the normalization of this type of love story that we explored in this and in New York, in New York Christmas wedding. So that's where I want to kind of push that more than anything. I want people to kind of see our films and kind of not try to pigeonhole it to a certain community, even though it's for the community, obviously, but it's also for a lot of people to, to kind of tiptoe themselves into the community by watching a film like ours, because there's some people who, who, who have strong opinions about our film because they didn't mm-hmm. Expect it to be a film about two women getting married, but it is that. But there are some people who are kind of grateful to kind of see that because they watch that with someone who they care about or someone who they know. They're saying, I would never would have felt so emotional about something without seeing it in this normal way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Again, my mind went five different thousand places, but you know, it's so hard to find a beautiful genuine love story and the fact that it was lgbtq plus makes it like 10 times more phenomenal but you were able to stay grounded in the concept 
of love and staying true to love. How did filming Jitters help you stay grounded and keeping that importance to stick with the concept of love when writing um, and directing a New York Christmas wedding? And yes, I did say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, it, we stayed grounded because of what you just said. We just stayed with the core about it's a love story. So to have Jennifer not be, she wasn't, Torn is the wrong, I mean, technically she was torn if you see the trailer, but to have Jennifer really love David a certain way, but her first love was this woman, Gabrielle, her best friend, more than a woman, it was her best friend. Mm -hmm. And to have her have this deep love and I just, I, I just, with, with Jitters and this, was just sticking to these really intimate relationships that are very, very strong, these lifelong relationships. And I think a lot of people have them a lot of people grow away from them because they feel as if, you know, I'm, that was years ago. I'm, I'm a different person, but to the core, you're still the same person. That person, like, like we say at the end of Jitters, I know you better than you know you. Like that one person out is out there who you may disregard and may not talk to, but they know you because they grew up and you were very, you're more open about who you were as a person when you were 12 than you are right now at whatever age you are. And you can ignore that and people do because they're different. They make money, but to that core, there's that one person out there that's kind of like, oh, I remember that person. I, I know their fears. I know their wants. I know their needs. And I know what really, I, I know, I know them. And I think to really explore that, because I really feel, and I, and I say this to anyone that the best thing you could possibly do, and it's a goal, obviously, for a lot of people is to marry your best friend and mm. marry your best friend, not your best friend that you grew up with, obviously, but just a best someone who is your best friend yeah. because yeah. you don't have to sugarcoat things. You don't have to um, you don't have to uh, be someone that you're not, you know. Um, and I think in our films, both both of our lead characters and David, I mean, in uh, Jennifer and uh, Michael, they both are being as ugly as they possibly can be, and their mm -hmm. partners in Blake and Gabrielle, they still love them. Mm -hmm. You know, and Gabrielle says that one line to Jennifer after they read the letter at, you know, after the big fight at her house, their house, mm -hmm. Gabrielle says, um, you know, we know the worst about each other and it's still okay. And, yeah. and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm just a sense of the person where I think, yeah, the person that loves you knows all the bad things. You know, you have a fight with someone, but I still love you. And, and I, yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of people are afraid to, show that ugly side of them because they don't want to lose the person they love. And I think the person that knows you best knows you have ugly sides because they do as well, but you're not afraid to show them. And when you show them, show them, you're, you're vulnerable to show them and show those flaws, the love could be even deeper. And, I, and I, that's, that's what I want to try to put out there into the world. And what I try to do, want to do myself too. You know, I'm learning from my own films because yeah, you write these films and they're almost like these heightened type of, uh, these perfect type of relationships. You know, I remember someone at a film festival said, you know, your Blake character during, during, during your short, he's a perfect man. <laughs> he never gets mad. At, he, <laughs> he never gets mad at his partner. I'm like, no, he, he gets mad, but I always wrote the film to think that Blake is someone who heard it over and over and over again. So he knows that if, if you're having these wedding jitters, Yay. yeah, if you're having these, it's more important, it's more important for you to get them out right now to me than to someone else, because I, I want to know this. I want to know what you're going through. And you talk to me, you get it out there. And once you're done, I'm going to say enough. They didn't love you. I love you. I can entertain it for a bit, but enough of that. Yeah. Get it together. You want this. And that's what, you know, it's almost like a coaching thing, like a sports thing as well. You know, I, it's, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah. I feel that. And I feel like I love that you're, it just feels like you're romantic at heart. Oh, is yeah. there like can people slide into your dms because i if they haven't fallen in love with you at this point i love that you're like you're kind of you you know you're that basketball player that like leaves their heart on the court on the floor <laughs> you know like you you put your heart and soul into everything and i guess let me say it, spoiler alert spoiler alert <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. If for a New York Christmas wedding, um, it, it was made with so much love and understanding uh, from, from the church to this coming out journey for Jennifer, 
Um, she lived her alternate life in a parallel universe before making the biggest decision of her life. Um, you know, and like I said, my wife and I really bawled our eyes out uh, when we watched this movie. Uh, I want to talk can't... about that too after you get after you get to this point. I want to know why you. What's bawled. that? I want to uh, know why you bawled. What? Why we bought? Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll <laughs> definitely. We'll okay. de- we connected with it so deeply and immensely that it was your heart was really in it when you created it from the actors, actresses to the produ- just everything, the writing, the verbiage, everything. Um, that we we bawled our eyes out, and you know, from it being, uh, you know, we connected with it so much from it being with a man to living this life in the shadows before officially deciding to come out. What was the biggest thing you connected with in this film? And then I'll let you know what we balled our eyes at. <laughs> well, I, I, I connected with the idea of um, this character, Jennifer, being able to, and at the time I was dealing with this, um, you're leaving, you're leaving one relationship and deciding it's more about your future rather than it's about what you think your future is supposed to be. Now I'm dealing with the breakup. So it was personal for me and definitely in a way where I definitely was someone who was kind of thinking about, wow, this, this person at a, at a, at a crossroad knows that my, I'm going to have the best life ever with David and his family, but am I going to be truly happy? And for me writing this film, it was really kind of having a mirror saying, you know, you're going to have this and this great life, but what do you really want? And that's why at the end of the film, when Azrael asked, asked Jennifer, are you happy? And she, you know, it's heartbreaking, but it's the truth. She says, it's hard to be right now, but I can be. <laughs> and, you know, for her to say something like that, which is very, very honest to say to someone, if you're going through what you're going through. And he says, I'm asking, are you happy? And then he's like, I, I give you the opportunity to, to make one final choice. And then Jennifer, which we all do as human beings, she says, but what about David? And as I has to remind her, it's not about David, it's about you and your choice. I'm asking you, what do you want? And a lot of times, some, not a lot of times, but for me, for me in the past, in a relationship, it's more about the other person. So then when you, when, you, when you really stand up and say, this is what you want, what do you want? And to explore that for this film, for me, was definitely something where I was kind of like, this is very, very strong. This is something that's universal and it's something that a lot of people could relate to because they've lived the life of what they thought they wanted at the certain time. But when they get later on in life, they realize I always wanted something different, but I never was honest with myself. So I had that. And then the flip side of it for me, which is very, very heavy, is the idea that the uh, aspect of how people who are gay or queer and a part of the LGBT community They've left the church because they don't. They were welcome there, but not equal. And I felt for me, I was I was just amazed and stunned that a lot of people were so taken aback by jitters because of the fact that they don't see these same sex marriages in a Catholic church. So then I thought, if I could have this in a feature film, it'll be one of the first times ever, and for our small indie. But I'm exploring something that people don't see because they don't. It's not real, basically. And, and, and I know it's not I know I know why it's not real. We all do. But in the end of it not being real, we could see someone blow up the White House in Independence Day, but we can't see two people get married in the church. Like, how, like why is that possible? <laughs> Literally, why is that possible? Um, That's so, so true. You know, we can see we can see things that are, we can see aliens. We can see yeah. we can see crazy amount of things. But two people get married in the church of the same sex. We're not allowed to see that. Mm-hmm. And when I say that out loud right now, I realize the, the, how how unique our film could be for that exact reason. You can see everything, but you haven't seen this. This is why our film, for a lot of people, they're kind of like, I've never seen this before. As a small independent film, not wow, but just like, I like seeing that, you know? Um, but yeah, for me, the, the, the church aspect is de- def- definitely very heavy to me because I felt that you have a priest who's seen these these two women grow up in the church and I'm, I'm a Catholic person. I, I go to mass and I, there's some priests who I know. And it, it's, it's interesting that they see you grow up, you know, you're baptized there, you commune there, you had your own, you had your own confirmation there and they know you and your friends. But when you say, Hey, father or priest, 
you know, me and so-and-so since we were seven, mm -hmm. we love each other. We want to get married with you officiated because you are our person. And they deep down inside want to support you, but then there's a higher power that they, that, 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 that doesn't support it, which then triggers them not to support it. So I, I was, I was very interested in that. I mean, I was, I was very much want to explore that because what does that mean when someone knows that their love is real, but because they can't be the one to kind of, they're not the boss more or less. So they can't be the one mm -hmm. to kind of cement their love and their marriage to other people. And I want to explore that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, to stay true to my half of it, uh, I, we connected with it on so many different levels from uh, living this parallel life, this different life, you know, in the shadows, in secret, you know, away from everybody. You know, we both, you know, I think that's a part of the coming out process and the, you know, when you're trying to discover who you are and where you fit in and, you know, what are these labels that everybody's talking about and this and that. And for us, it was, you know, we had these different coming out experiences. Like for me, I was living this life of having crushes on girls, but not realizing that I was having crushes on girls. I was with men thinking that I had these intense feelings. But when I, then when I was with a woman, that was like, wow, yeah. that's an intense feeling. <laughs> My now wife. Um, but we let her mom know that I had proposed. Mind you, I had tried to ask for her blessing, <laughs> which is probably the first mistake. <laughs> but I tried to be the gentlewoman that I am. And I tried to ask for her blessing on three different occasions. And I asked her and she kind of just always gave me the shake off, like the like the convenient, you know, the cool shake off like, oh, you know, you know, it's confusing, you know. And so she never wanted to answer it. So she never said yes or no. Yeah. yeah. And and so it was interesting. So I was like, you know, we've been taking this next step. We continue. You know, she came into the relationship with a son we're a family. Like, this is crazy that I'm not going to take the next step. So I decided to propose and we held on to that. And then she said, I'm going to tell my mom that mm -hmm. you proposed. And I said, yes, we're engaged. She let her mom know. Her mom immediately um, summoned <laughs> myself, my wife, and my mom for a meeting at our house. And I said, this is not a good idea. This like an Algerian, I don't some Nigerian meeting or like you know, uh, or land or like you know the Lannisters. Something's gonna happen bad. Something's yeah, happen. you know, like, some what? shit's about to pop off. <laughs> like, and I was like, I don't want this at the house. I don't want this bad juju. I don't want this bad energy at the house. And so we decided to do it the house anyway. Still need to save the house. Um, but. <laughs> She, but she came to the house and she was like, I'm not going to be a part of this wedding. I'm not going to be a part of this at all. <laughs> She's like, Jamila, I love you for, you know, I love you. You've been great for my, my daughter, this and that, but I'm not going to be a part of it. And she claimed that it was due to religious reasons. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. hit us. So your film yeah. hit us deeper in La Corazon. Yeah. Uh, a little deeper. Also, than... also because Mr. Ortiz, he's, you know, he's Hispanic yeah. and he's someone who has the yeah. accent and someone who is just almost like the Danny Tanner for, yeah. for, for, for career love. Yeah. So it was crazy that she summoned my mom. It was her. She's citing religious reasons. My mom is super Catholic. She's Haitian. Yeah. It comes yeah. with the territory. You're Haitian. Yeah. You're Catholic. So I'm Catholic. You know, I'm probably not the greatest Catholic, but I'm Catholic. Yeah. And, you know, but I could cite you the Christopher verses, you know, like that, yeah. you know, of protection. And yeah. but, you know, when I went to, to Saturday school before a little AYSO soccer games, you know, I was about that life. Yeah. And then, so my mom, you know, with her little rosary uh, bracelet, you know, she had a rosary type of uh, bracelet. And she was like, so like, what does religion have to do with them being happy? Like they're happy. Yeah. And so it was interesting to see my mom be the character almost of Jennifer's father of saying, 
I just want you to be happy. I know this is different. I know it's a Catholicism is a different experience with, with LGBTQ love and rights and all of this other stuff. And so it was, it hit extra hard for yeah. us. Yeah. And, it, and the fact that you did it in a church, you know, yeah. the wedding was in a church. You've done two films yeah. in a church, yeah. Yeah. you know? And then, so we ended up, her mom wasn't going to be a part of it. We ended up getting married in July during quarantine and her mom still didn't come to wow. the actual ceremony. So yeah. we just did the ceremony. We're going to save the party for like later when we can actually like hug and kiss everybody that, in a safe did. space. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, and so we connected with it on so many deep levels. We mm -hmm. were both with men. Then we had this, aha moment of being with women to religion being a hiccup um it's it's it would it, it hit us you know yeah. and that is such a beautiful film and for folks that hear me going off on this tangent i hope that y'all watch this film because it's so deep um and, and, and i'm happy you say that because because of the fact that it's, it's an independent film and we went to studios to kind of to pre-sell the film, the script, and hopefully a studio would have said, okay, here's X amount of money, go film it. But studios, with me as a first-time writer-director, they would not give money for, for that. But luckily to the production company, Conglomerate Media, they said, we're still going to do this because your script is good. You know, you have a good script and we're going to make this happen. So to make this film like that and not have other people involved to kind of say, do it this way, do it that way, is one of the reasons why, to your point, you're seeing my heart in this story without having it be kind of tainted by studio notes, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> tainted by the idea of having a, having a, the Vinny character be someone who is black. I mean, having have some kind of crazy thing. It was so authentic to me in my, my history growing up where this film was that. And I always say the more specific something is, the more universal it is. So mm -hmm. for me to kind of write this film about a first love or me write this film about someone's trying to find themselves and their courage and me some, write a story about a priest realizing that love, love is something that you can't put a label on it through gender, it's just love. I mean, all, mm -hmm. those, all those different things I was exploring is in this film and it's, it's, it's amazing to know. And I always say this film is something that people should watch together with their spouse because they each person will see it differently. And when you do that, it makes for a bigger conversation. And when you do that, you realize, what did I bring to this film? And for obviously because of the recent, the recent wedding for you both, you know, it, it's definitely more emotional. And also for the fact of the characters too. And, and I think to hear what you're saying, and if, if I made this film and only you saw it and hear what you said, I'll be more than happy, you know, because Aww. it's knowing that it's touching in a way where I wrote it for that intention to be witness and seen. It's, it's, not, it's not just a film to be like, oh, I made a film, look at this. No, it's like, I made a film that I'm exploring a lot of different things that I think are universal, that I think are personal. And I hope other people can relate to this in a way that I feel as if, it's like, don't you see this? Don't you don't don't you understand that there's some people who are gay who grew up gay, and then because they love a woman or love a man the same sex, they leave a church and they're out there lost because the church that they grew up in their whole lives they they they, they ignore them. I mean, that really bothers me to know that yeah. people people have to step away from religion, not even thoughts of religion, because of who they love. It's it's bizarre. And then, you know, in, in the churches and the, the stances, some of them, they still go to church, but they still go there because they know or they may feel it's like, OK, yes, I may love someone else, someone, someone I'm married to someone, too. But my church will come around eventually. It's, it's an old system, but they still go there and support. I mean, it's, it's so bizarre to me. And it, it's, it's and, and I say this in a very serious way where Marsha P. Johnson had her fight and my fight is not for equal marriage in the church. Not, that's not my fight, but I also know I could say something about it because I know, I know how important it is to see people see themselves on screen in a happy way. So I'm going to keep on doing what I can do to kind of keep spreading that message. I love that. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. 
spoiler alert. <laughs> I'm going to give all the spoiler alerts right now. So if you haven't seen a New York Christmas wedding and you don't want a spoiler alert, just hit pause and we'll be right here waiting for you when you finish watching a New York Christmas wedding. So a New York Christmas wedding um, was was made with so much love and understanding from the church um, you know, and we and we talked about, um, you know, what your biggest thing was that you connected with. Um, Jennifer lived a, a life where she felt like she was living it for someone else. She she was trying to find herself in this process. Um, what was something that you felt like you did for someone else that you mm-hmm. lived a part of your life for someone else? Jamila, you're going right there. I love it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, where are you the months ago when I had to kind of figure out what the hell was going on? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's very interesting for me because Jennifer, it's as the writer, Jennifer, there's, a, a, there's an umbrella of um, character traits that we both possess but because she's female and I'm male it's like you know it's all hidden in there but I definitely felt growing up as um a son of Nigerian parents my parents wanted me to be something other than an artist and I, I understand why and they understand why also because they immigrated to America and they had sacrifices for my sister and I to kind of go out there and do something great because you're in America, right? So um, growing up before 2008, they wanted me to do certain things and I wanted to play sports and I wanted to do other things. And I knew early on in my life that I was going to do what I wanted to do and my parents are either going to support that or they'll be upset. So early on in my life, they supported it. So I never was... I never had any ambitions for my parents, but once I pursued acting and once I started getting into a personal lifestyle, I was able to then, I always wanted, I always wanted to pursue the arts, but also pursue the arts in a way that's um, full on. And as a young actor, you always think, well, I, I could definitely sleep on the floor at someone's house and not make any money and just, put all my money into the headshots and the art and acting classes. And that's great, but it's not, it's not a way to live life. You know, it, it's something that you could, you could really admire because someone made it in these type of, how do you make it stories? But my life wasn't that for the past couple of years, but after a while living in a, a good life, I was definitely missing something to the core. And that was for me, it was definitely a, a deep, deep, love that was more than this is good for my future. So I think definitely for Jennifer's character, for myself, the past couple of years is more the idea of symbolizing of, I want to be able to have a love that's more so present in time than it is the love that's going to be better for me two years from now. And I think in that more than anything is what Jennifer is about choice. And Jennifer's choice at the end is her choice, technically, but her choosing is what people can relate to because everything in life is about choices. How do you make that choice? And we have jitters when it comes to making choices, but for Jennifer, she made the choice because it was her own. And for me, when I had to decide what do I want in life, it was difficult, it was hard. You don't want to hurt someone, but also you want to be honest to yourself because it's your life. And Going back to that one scene when Jennifer and Asriel speak to each other, it's literally, it's your life. What do you want? And there's so many people I've spoken to. I remember my friend, Victoria, filmmaker, she saw the film and early on in early draft. And she was kind of just like, I cried so much at your film. You don't understand. This film is going to be do so well for you. I'm like, uh, I mean, it's a small film. Like, you know, you don't understand. I cried, cried, cried because when I'm going through my life, it gave me an outlet to kind of just let it all go and really kind of see things differently because your character's struggle. Yeah. It's a holiday film, whatever, but you're seeing someone with deep, not even, not just grief, but someone who's really battling a choice in her core. And as she battles this choice, how does she come to her decision? When she comes to it, 
she comes to it, doesn't look back. And I think that's so hard for a lot of people. It's very hard for me because I care so much about other people and this and that. But I had to kind of grow up in a way and realize that my choice is my choice. And I have to stand by that unapologetically. Yeah. I mean, your choice to be an ally to the community and to continue to create such beautiful content and films and all of that good stuff, having Nigerian parents, did you feel this sense of pressure or sense of, you know, maybe not so much that is, is, is that something that you want to do? I, you know, my mom is from Haiti, so I know, you know, third world countries like you know other (laughs) other countries could be a little different you know and lgbtq rights you know in the caribbean are a very questionable stance how did your family take that in being that you are contributing to the lgbtq plus community and and you know showing that beauty and that love yeah i i I think for (laughs) <laughs> I laugh because growing up, I, I loved NSYNC, Britney Spears, all pop music in the 90s. So my mother <laughs> back then, made me, you know, this kid keeps listening to Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, he's there's something there. <laughs> um, but I, I think I, I think for the most part, my, my mother, me playing sports and me, my mother raising us, she always appreciated or always, always enjoyed the fact that I was someone who was more emotional because we connected in a way because I was always like, mom, this is what happened. Mom, this, mom, this, mom, that she really enjoyed that. And when I started acting and I was getting these roles, she was always just kind of like, you know, Oh, that's good. Oh, how much do they pay you? You know, as a mother, she always asked that. Yeah. <laughs> so I did Stonewall for the first, when I, when I got Stonewall, I'm like, mom, I called mom, my mom, like, mom, I got Stonewall. It's so exciting. Like, how much are they paying you? It's kind of like, oh, okay. And then, you know, I told her the role, what I'm doing. And she kind of heard it and didn't really know much about it. But we went to the theaters and watched the film. And I think for her, she was very proud to see her son on a silver screen. And for her, because she was, I was able to talk to her about what Marsha meant to me or what Marsha means to the world, especially New York City, that she understood that. There was no, there was no like... um qualms about me playing someone and doing drag you know I remember there, there was a photo that I had where it's like you know hi mom hi mom hi mom <laughs> it's like hi mom but me and drag and drag wear so my mother kind of she never found it like comical nothing about that she kind of just said oh okay but I think that part of her saying okay she kind of this understanding that it's still her son in there but her son is being brave enough to do this. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, it was very, I was really appreciative of my mom to be supportive in that way. And then when I did, when I did Jitters, she definitely was kind of, she went to film festivals. She loved the story. She was just, she just loved the, she loved the story of it because she loved the religious aspect because she saw that. And my mother is someone who like wants grandkids tomorrow. So it's like, she definitely <laughs> is happy that I'm kind of like exploring the, the theme of marriage. Yeah. And um, when I told her about this feature film, she was, she was, she saw the film and she was kind of like, you know, I really like this film. It won't be for Hallmark because it won't be, but Lifetime definitely pick it up. You know, because we (laughs) we saw, I watched Christmas films with her growing up. So I, it's almost like, I kind of feel like I'm making all these films. So my mom could just watch me on screen because I'm buying for her attention still (laughs) 35 years later. I don't know. (laughs) But um, she saw the film and she was just kind of just like, you know, She's like, I really like this film, but how did you, how did you think of the Azriel character, that Azriel connection with this and that? How did you, th- how did you think of that? Because she was so just amazed how it all made sense to her because she's seen so many Christmas stories. Like, again, mm-hmm. there's people like my mother who are out there who have seen Christmas stories out the wazoo. So no matter what, when they watch something, it's nothing new to them, basically. Mm-hmm. They're just watching something in the background and they're kind of doing something else. But I feel with our film, the first five minutes, you see Jennifer, you you're introduce Jennifer as an adult, as, as she's putting down a dog. And it's kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa what is this? This is, this is not your yeah. normal Christmas film. And hopefully at that moment, people are kind of like, okay, what's happening here? And some people, it's too much for them. And I get that. Yeah. But like I said, it's New York. You know, things are a little bit grittier out here. And it's also, it's an opportunity where this is definitely a film where it's not your traditional holiday film. It's something different. And it has to be different. Go back to what we said before. It has to be different because it's an independent film. 
no way am I, I'm going to make a film about Jennifer Ortiz going to New Rochelle, New York, and picking out Christmas trees and falling in love with some like Christmas tree handler <laughs> and having love in Connecticut. Like, who cares about that? It's boring, you know. I We've seen it before. We've seen it, be- was- We've seen it before in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> But that's you know, true, we, though, like those rom-coms, and it's just like, oh, yeah. we've been here. How many times yeah. can we see the the straight yeah. female fall in love with the yeah. unsuspecting, the quote-unquote yeah. unsuspecting <laughs> fellow? Yeah. But this was yeah. truly made with love, and there was a love connection. Yep. Like, I almost want to follow, like, the part two of their life, the love, you know? For this film, yeah. it was... If there was a church scene and the, and the church was okay with you filming there. But then when they caught wind the, that there was a gay wedding um, yeah. that was being shot in the church, they changed their tune um, yeah. and didn't want the exterior of the church uh, being shown. Um, they were supportive, but then didn't want their name on it. The priest had read the script and said that it, it didn't bother him, but then it was it was the church members um, that gave him a hard time because they had heard that there was a gay same sex marriage taking place. Yeah. With most churches in New York saying no, what was your feeling after they changed their stance on the filming in their church? Well, at that point in time, it was a fourteen day shoot. That was um, that was the end of the second week. So we're at day, day 10 and you're like, we're almost there at the finish line. And the big thing about it, part of this film is a wedding. You know, we have to have this scene happen and you have like Chris Noth who's going to be there, you know? So it's like for this small production, we have to have everything perfect. And we go there and the priest who, and that, that same church, I was, I was confirmed there. So I had to kind of pull out all the stops about how this is personal to me to film here. So that's one of the reasons why I was able to kind of film there because it was a personal connection where luckily this priest, almost like Father Kelly, I'm not just someone that's trying trying, trying to make a, a, a same-sex Christmas film. I'm someone who literally, I my history is in this church and I'm coming mm-hmm. to you to say, this is my first film, please support me on this. And it's almost like when you know someone, you put them on the spot. And that's why that, that scene with Gabby and Father Kelly is so important to me. When she, when, when Gabby's like, you know, you know us, marry yeah. us. Yeah. I got to think about it. But, you know, if someone knows you and they want to say no to your face, you know, I, I've dealt with that many times in my life, in my career, where it's kind of like, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to ask you something. You say no to me. Tell me no. Don't fucking text me. Don't email me. Tell me no to my face. And some people can't do that. So with that opportunity i went to this church say i want to film this here please 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 please. they said yes come the day of extras extras are there crews there chris note is there (laughs) you know (laughs) we're gonna do this and then the priest pulled me to the side it's like you know i can't stop this but we can't have our name here you know you can't shoot exteriors that's a hard thing too because we had some exterior scenes there and and the film is great as it is, obviously, because you get it. But there's some people who are very critical. They're like, well, we have, we don't see this. We don't see that. With independent film, each minute on screen costs a lot of money. And I was also honest to the idea and respecting the priest's wishes by not filming things on the exterior. You know, we wrote mm-hmm. scenes for that. And we could have had that. We could have just said, yeah, whatever, filmed it anyway. And then a year later, whatever, surprise on Netflix. But I was true and i and i respected his wishes by not doing that and i think the film doesn't suffer by that at all but it's almost more to people who hear the story they realize oh the personal aspect of what it takes to film something like that because in the end my main goal is to film this in the church we got it done and we had to kind of take some losses in a sense that we did because we could have filmed exteriors but in the end we got what we wanted because the main the most important thing about this film was the wedding obviously and we got that we got that in a church and, you know, it, it's, it's just very, and this sentimental see like a Christmas wedding. And some people are like, oh, but the, the, the churches are filled. I've, I've been to churches on Christmas, Christmas Eve and it's filled. And it's like, yeah, it's an independent film fella. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, this is something <laughs> where we have, my mom's in that scene, you know, we have friends and family in the scene too. So it's just, it's just, you know, it, it's very personal. And I, and I think more than anything for a first film, and my our producer Ian Phillips says it all the time. It's like 
to have your first film and it be a genre-based film, a Christmas film, you don't see that. And mm-hmm. it's showing you're showing people that not even taking a risk, but you're, you're showing people that this is different. So you kind of like, what's going on with this guy? You know, this is totally different. Yeah. His first film yeah. is a genre film, a Christmas film that obviously it's not a personal film by him as a basketball player turned actor. Like, you know, people care about that. But for me, it's like, uh, but um, this film is definitely something where it's kind of like, whoa, this is like, you have the first film in history of a same sex marriage with diverse leads ever. I mean, yeah. that, that's a fact. No one can take that away. You know, we, we were compared with films where these big budget studio films, we don't have that, but we had an original idea and we did it. That's the whole thing. We didn't wait for studio to say, yes, do it now. We did it. And I, I promise you, I promise you, Jamila, there's going to be so many films, not so many, there'll be, there'll be more films like ours three years from now. And, um, and we applaud that. But I also think more than anything, like yourself and others and your wife and people will realize that our film is first. And that's where I want to follow my career being first for a lot of different things. Yeah. You truly are the first for many different yeah. things. And I, to have a same sex wedding in a church and to acknowledge religion and to speak of religion and using that relationship of I'm a parisher, I'm a part of this church. Uh, but now you've changed your tune. You know, mm. there's this unconditional, there's supposed to be this unconditional love from the church and from this religion that I've dedicated my life to, but now it's different, you know, and that's amazing that you were able to use your personal relationship with that church and that you were able to do it, to do it there. Is that, was that the same church that you did um, Jitters in? No, actually the Jitters was done in the church I went to, um, uh, but I moved to uh, the Upper West Side and, that church, we, again, I, I, I was a first time filmmaker there. I'm like, oh, I go to this, I go, I'm literally naive as I was. I go to this church and after every mass, I, I shake the priest's hand. So I'm going to ask him, hey, priest, you know, you said no, no, we need help. I want to make a film. Can I film here? And I asked him, he said, oh yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll discuss it. And I said, you know, I'm doing this short film. I would love to kind of film here. We don't have any money. And this priest is very big on the outreach for the LGBT community. Mm-hmm. And I'm um, he said, yeah, we could film here. We took one day, we filmed nine pages in one day, all the backroom scenes. And then after that, we filmed the wedding scene downstairs. And for a lot of people to, feel, to be in the church seeing this, it just felt so uh, real, right? Yeah. So we did that. The priest enjoyed the film, enjoyed what happened. And then two years later, we're doing this feature film. I wanted to film this there again. And I went to the priest again. He's, and then the priest said, he actually gave me feedback on my, on my script for notes purposes. So a lot of people out there who have criticism about would the priest say this, would this happen? And the priest, and I gave, I went to him early on. He's like, you know, this creative, this artistic, artistic creativity, do it. You know what I mean? Do what you want to do and yeah. just tell your story. And I said, can we film here? I went to the run around with them for about three weeks. And then finally they said, we're doing renovations. You can't film here during your dates. And I said, okay, we film, we find another church. And I come to find out a month later during post that same priest that allows to film jitters there at the church and basically said, we couldn't film Chris's wedding. That same priest was removed from ministry because he gave bad advice to a, a, a parishioner that supported LGBTQ movement, basically. So what happened, it's a, all these articles about it where the priest basically, there was a parishioner that wanted to become, wanted to get into the priesthood, basically. And the parishioner went to our priest and said, you know, I want to go forward into my devotion to God. And, but I have thoughts of same sex. And I don't know what this means. I'm very, I'm very, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't, I'm wrong. And the priest told him is like, you, you know, there's nothing wrong about you. You're not, you're not a broken man. This mm-hmm. is a broken system. And how you deal with the broken system is that you lie. Mm-hmm. And that was documented. And because of that, the, the higher ups, the um, 
archdiocese found out and they removed from ministry. And this is a priest I went to for three, three years and come to find out we made this film and that he was removed from ministry because it came out that he was basically telling people who were, who were feeling queer to him to lie about your, to lie about your sexuality. Because if you say that you're queer, as you're trying to go evolve, go further in the priesthood, they would stop you from doing that. Mind you, there's nothing wrong with you. You know what I mean? So this right. this like paradox of people where oh, wow. he's giving he's giving great advice to someone who's dealing mm-hmm. with something, but he's he's at the high level that's telling people you do this, but still when you get there, just be who you it's it's very, very confusing. And when we when I heard that and I read that, he's removed from the church. I'm really like this this film that we're making that we made is really a mirror to what's happening in this world. There are priests out there like Father Kelly, Chris Dole's character, who support gay marriage, gay love, everything about it. But since they work in a system, they could never go out there and, and, and not defy, but they can never go out there and really stand up and say, I'm marrying these people in this church. They can't do that. Mm-hmm. Behind closed mm-hmm. doors, and we say at the end of the film where um, uh, his uh, secretary, Jane, says, you know, mm-hmm. he, you know Father, Kelly was, Father Kelly was as communicator for doing many private same-sex marriages. We wanted to show the reality of like, if you do that, you're going to get caught in this type of like churchhood. But in reality, I felt for Father Kelly's character during the film, when he performs the surprise wedding for Jennifer and Gabby and the uh, offering of communion, he's doing that where even if it's not, you know, as you know, for yourself, you get married, you have to sign papers. Having that type of wedding doesn't mean you're married. I mean, it's nice, but it's almost like for show, but the papers are official. So he's doing that as a declaration of like, I'm going to defy the church today because I'm standing with love before anything. This is a legit thing people are dealing with. And to, to your point, luckily for you, you're smart enough to know that you went, you went into, the, you, you grew up mm-hmm. going to Saturday school. You, you knew what you were, you knew what was going on. But there's some people who watch this film. There's someone that said to me, he's like, I wish I saw this film 20 years ago because it would change my life. Not in a way like pat myself in the back, the reality of like, I would know that it's okay to have the feelings that I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that what triggered kind of like the motion of, uh, you know, Father Kelly being, you know, excommunicated from the church and all of this other thing that he was basically going rogue doing these independent ceremonies but meanwhile in real life it was the secretary saying well he did our he did our wedding too he did our ceremony too and i was like what that was so awesome for for it to come full circle with he, he even did the secretary's ceremony but he's been kicked out of the church you know, yeah. and, I, and I have, I'm happy you say that there, there's some people like I read everything. There's some people like, well, if he does, if he did the secretary's uh, secretary's wedding, then why is she still there? If she's gay. It's like, well, because <laughs> there's a lot of gay people that work at the church. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No one knows about it, but they are. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> exactly. anyways, so. <laughs> but that's, but that's, the real, that's, the real, that's you, you get that because you get the, you get the characters of people. But some people, yeah. they want to get so technical. But in the end, you saw what was the intention where. It's a full circle moment because in the end, he's not there anymore. But what he's done in uniting people will live on forever. Love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, yeah. It's, uh, go ahead. Sorry. It's the invisible femme. It's the invisible yeah. elderly white femme that was the secretary. And it was almost so unsuspecting because when she's like, oh, you know, he did our ceremony. You know, he married my wife and I. And I was like... Wait, what? Hey, but you said it like <laughs> Father Kelly is no longer here. Like he was a problem, but yeah. he did yeah. your wedding. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. the hell? Yeah. yeah. Like it was very, Definitely. it was very interesting to see that balance and that juxta- juxtaposition in the church because that's really real life. You have yeah. these yeah. invisible femmes and lesbians and gay folks that are just really low key. And they're like, oh, yeah, the priest did this for me, but like he's no longer with us because he did some stuff that was no longer with the church. Like yeah. you didn't go yeah. with him. What the fuck? You yeah. know, it, it, it actually, too, is that with that. I did my research and I went to some of the church just to kind of film this year that we talked about before. And then there was one like um, Catholic 
artistic community that I joined for like a weekend and I kind of went to kind of went to like a meeting to kind of see what people are talking about. And I brought up this film because I, I knew this film. I, I felt because what I, what I was writing before we filmed it, I'm like, what I'm writing is very personal to me. It's very, and I get the aspect of, I'm like, I, for me, I felt like I wasn't intentional, but I felt people would see me challenging the church in a way. And I wasn't doing that, but I could see why people could see that. Because it was really, I'm, I'm just putting a mirror to the reality of like, you're saying this, but yet you're saying people are this. Answer this, but no one can answer this because the higher answer comes to, to comes to the higher power, which it gets contradictory when it gets lower, 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 obviously. So um, I was in this community, uh, this, uh, this, this church, like artistic, like uh, group basically for like a weekend. And I mentioned this film and then they're like, they all were silent when I told the whole story. They were kind of like, uh. <laughs> um, I, I mean we get it it's art but you know but to have a wedding in the church a same-sex wedding that's not real I'm like I know but this is this this is that and they're like well we just hope that you show the reality of what could really happen and that for me was helpful because I had I was reminded where we could go full Hallmark and kind of just be like, this is so, this is so great. But the reality is like, and I, and I love to see another moment in the scene when Father Kelly's speaking before he said, love is love. There's three people that walk out during his gospel. You know, mm-hmm. there are people, some people come like this. I didn't come here for this. Mm-hmm. And that's real. And there's some people really, and there, <laughs> yeah, there's one person, is. you know what I mean? That's real. There's one person saw this film from Florida. He said, I was watching with my mother. And when people got up and left, she was kind of just like, Fuck that! That's a real that's a real thing that happened. Some people just yeah. really, some people are all about love, and some people are just kind of like fuck this. I don't want to see this, mm-hmm. and not more power to them. But they have a right to walk away. But if you walk away, that was that's the whole fight. People, the whole I think a lot of these uh, institutions they don't want to lose parishioners over this type of like, you know, do you support this? Do you support mm-hmm. that or not? But. In Father Kelly's stance at their official church, Our Lady of Hope, he's like, this is what our church is doing now and here or now. If you want to leave, leave. But if you want to stay here, we're, we're embracing love here. Mm-hmm. And what better time than Christmas Day? Yeah, that was that that film is so deep. So if y'all are still listening and haven't gone to see it, go make sure you check it out. Um, for you, Atoje. Having yep. queer roles was important to you. And when it came uh, to looking for who would fill the role of Azriel, um, you had gone to GLAAD um, to cast trans and non-binary actors, um, and they were supportive early in the script process, uh, but made a deep, life-altering statement that triggered the change, the character change. Um, And they said that it would be very problematic because you're adding to the idea that trans or binary people are mythical rather than real. Um, It was said to you that, uh, you know, what, what did you feel in that moment when they said, let's kind of change it up and let's look deeper in that process. Yeah. I, I was very, I was very happy to know that, they were honest one very happy to know they liked the script but they also knew that it's hard because at that point in time especially me as a as an ally how do i tell this story and not and i experienced it with stonewall how do i not get how do people how do i not attract (laughs) bad bad attention to me because like Mm -hmm. who am i to tell the story and i get that and a lot of people hopefully more of them are like this in our business where they want to be able to tell the story correctly so um very conscious of casting queer people. And there's some queer people that would say no to a film, not just because people, people who are queer won't say yes to a film because it's a film with a queer role. No, sometimes a low budget film, this, the reason why it's hard, hard to make a low budget film because it's hard and people don't want to work for no money. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. um, we cast queer people, but also for the angel character, I just knew because for me, Asriel as a character developing him, developing Asriel, he was just so much, he was just so interesting and so he was so worldly. He was so uh, experienced. He was so energetic. He was flamboyant. Cause I thought that was fun too. And um, mm-hmm. 
I knew for a fact to have someone who was trans would be great because I, I wanted to kind of push the narrative a little bit. Imagine having a trans angel in a Christmas film. Who would have oh, thought, you know? That'd be and fire I went to, right there. <laughs> I, went to find that. I, went, I, went, I went to find that, but when Glad said that, I felt like, fuck, they're right because yeah. the intention is like, almost like Roland. The intention is the right thing to do. But luckily I had this, I had their support early on rather than when the film is made. So I'm able to be like, okay, I can't do that. So let me mm-hmm. really cast the best actor for the role. And that was Cooper Koch. You know, he mm-hmm. read the description and for him, he, he walked in, he's Asriel. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful person, beautiful soul, um, energetic, spiritual. You know, he, he talked about, and there's a lot of time people, people would have some strong comments about, you know, this angel character, you know, he's so, he's, he's so gay. He says this, he says that. Mm-hmm. These are queer people saying that. I'm thinking, this is a problem, you guys. You don't mm-hmm. understand that. You have a, you have a, 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 a gay angel for the first time you're seeing this ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, there'll be more. Mm-hmm. First we're seeing this and you're saying that he's too gay. What? Mm-hmm. But, but, but what's funny about that is that Cooper is Cooper. So now is Cooper not the right gay person for a gay role? This, 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 right. this is what I think now. You know what I mean? It's like you, you kind of fight for these roles and people get them and they're awarded them because they're great actor, actors. And then you feel like, oh, they're not, they're not the right gay we want for this role. And it's like, and this is like a small, like, like a half a percent yeah. of people. But when I see that, I stick to it because I'm so defensive of Cooper because he's, mm-hmm. he's my choice. He's the best actor and he's almost, he's, he, he gave so much to our film and he's the, he's the core of this film. And um, yeah, I, 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 d- I just love everything that he's done with the film. And I, and I love when people, there's one comment I saw for someone who's like, um, you know, Azrael, I hate you. You made me cry so much, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, Azrael, it's like this, he's, he literally, he gave up his life for the love of his, mm-hmm. for, the, for his mother to experience love one more time, you know? Yeah. Um, it, that, it goes very, very deep in that way. But there's some people that want to go deep. And I feel like you and your wife will go that deep and I'll forever talk to you both. But some people don't yeah. want to go that deep to my point. I want to speak this film and kind of just have in the background. But some people, like who I am, this is a film I want to see. Something that goes deeper, kind of like, it makes me think about my own life. And I think this film... Yeah. And the Azra character has that, you know, people talked about the whole idea of like having, um, you know, Azra being a stillborn. And my mother, I tell my mother about these type of opportunities that people are saying these things. And my mother's like, well, people don't understand that, you know, Azrael, he's, he's, he's an angel. Angels are different. They're, they're, they come in different ages and sizes and this and this and that. And people are so st- stuck on the idea that he was a stillborn child. And I get why they're upset, not upset about it. I get why they kind of question that. But there's some people who, when they have a child and they lose that child after three months, until the day they die, that child is still with them as a mm-hmm. person or a thing. And it's not pro, pro-life or pro-choice. It's not about that. It's about someone going through something and then never forgetting that. And yeah. Asriel's a character and Asriel's a spirit that Gabrielle will never forget. And Jennifer never knew about Asriel and why, why Gabby held on to this. Then when she meets Azriel and finds out that Azriel is, is Gabriel's son, and Jennifer says right away, you need to meet her. And Gabriel needs to meet you. It's like, no, no, it's not about you. I came here for, I came, it's not about her. I came here for you. So, I mean, all, the, all those things that Jennifer is going through, people have to really like, get away from the whole Azriel character idea. But think about someone for the first time saying, like, I, I came here for you as a spirit because... I'm your guardian angel. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it, 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 there's so much, and that's more so because because Jennifer's choice will deepen her his mother's life because it's a love connection in a, in a way. Mm-hmm. So we're going I love Azriel's presence and everything that he brings to the film throughout the film. I feel like he was a beautiful balance to the film and the yeah. storyline and. You know, yeah, it's, you know, stillborn, but it's what your stillborn thinks, what they feel, what they are yeah. as a as a person, as a presence, as a spirit. And 
I feel like he played that character so beautifully. He was as, yep. as Cooper was such a great additive as as Rio. Um, and for folks to say that he was too gay, you know, and yeah. this and that, and like he's he's really gay. He's really a gay actor. <laughs> You yeah, know, yeah, like exactly. what did yeah, that yeah. make you feel uh, to say this is a gay man who's playing Azriel in a lesbian relationship in some sort? What did that make you feel like? I like I would be so, uh, yeah. How did that make you feel? Because he was such. Uh, whenever he would come up, I was as soon as he established who he was in the film. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. Every time he pops up, it's like, oh, shit. He's going to come with some gems right now. Yep, exactly. What was, exactly. That, <laughs> what was that process like? Well, for me, I definitely wanted I definitely wanted him, um, Azriel, to... Uh, we had the idea where we shot a scene, but we didn't have it in the final film where people are like, why is, he, why is Azriel so upset at the ending? It's like, because we have a scene when Azriel when Jennifer wakes up after making love for the first time to a woman, mind you, you know, this whole mm-hmm. Christmas type of love, love they had. It's the first time going back to what you said about, you know, the, the deeper connection with the woman, Jennifer's making love to a woman, her love to David is one thing, but to make a love to a woman that she wanted to make love to since she was 17. What is mm-hmm. that like? Right. So she wakes, wakes up the next day before going to church. We had the idea where um, we, I wrote it where Jennifer is walking smudge, her dog, Willa Grace Abbott, without an Instagram handle. Um, hey. <laughs> he walks, he walks Hashtag. Smudge. Yeah. <laughs> walking smudge. And she sees Azra in the alleyway. And she tells smudge, oh, let's go the other way. So, you know what I mean? The idea, like, she sees Azra. So at that point in time, we're reminded as an audience that this isn't real, that Azra is going to end this sometime. And that would have helped in a strong way, but we couldn't without with time, we couldn't do it. So it's fine. But um, I think for me to have Azriel have Cooper bring so much life to Azriel, I just knew that on paper, the character is just so, so enriched with, I transcend everything, but in my heart, it's all about love. And it's all about you, like you, Jennifer, you've been, you've been missing a lot your whole life and I'm here to give this all back to you I'm here to empower you Jennifer and to have an angel do that have asked to do that for Jennifer it's really for me I mean it's it's so emotional because of the fact that we all need that type of person to kind of stir us back into the right way and to have an angel and go with Christmas and the whole spiritual type of being thing to have an angel stir someone back into the reality of like you're gonna get married to this man but let me remind you, Jennifer, you were deep love with a woman. And don't ever forget that because that love is a real love. And let's talk about the idea in reality, too. This is 1999. When, when you're in love with someone in 1999, when you're young and 17, you to your point, you question it where it's like, this isn't real. I'm going through something, whatever, fine. But that may have been that was that was a real that was the real love that Jennifer ever, ever had in her whole life. You know, so mm-hmm. in 1999, you can't really people aren't out and about expressing their love for the same sex at that time. In 2020, yes, of course, because we're all like grown now. We're in the know. But 1999, that wasn't that at all. You know, to say you loved your best friend who was a girl, a same sex is like you have to be very, very brave in that sense. Mm-hmm. But in 2020, it's kind of like, oh, you know, mom, I love so and so. Like, Oh, yeah. You guys hang out all the time and laugh. Great. But 1999, it'd be really, really brave. And I think. But it's all about a young love at that time. And I, I mean, I wanted to explore that. And I think our young actors at the end of the film, when they finally say I love you to each other, it's really exciting to kind of, I see, I still see the older girls saying I love you as younger girls because it still seems like, seems like them. For people who uh, use religion as a way to not support gay marriage. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah what yeah. would you say to them as they use gay marriage as a shield mm. to not support same sex love and or same sex marriage to deny the acknowledgement of someone else's love for someone else because they have their, their same sex mm-hmm. is really denying how strong love could be, how strong, a, how strong the message of love, how strong the connection of love could really be because love there's there's a quote, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a Bible quote where love is patient, love is kind Love, I mean, there's 
so much of that. But in the end, it's like that type of love is first Corinthians, I believe. I believe, yeah. Yeah, first Corinthians 14. Um Wedding Crashers, not just me reading the Bible. I remember that from Wedding Crashers. Um, I'm sorry. Are we do we have a special appearance right now? Yeah. 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 <laughs> there we go. Oh, I told shit. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I am uh dying on the inside right now. We have hey Chris, how are you? How you doing? I'm sorry. Oh my I'm goodness. Out. I'm out on my porch here in the Berkshires and uh, the lighting's not great. So if it looks a little spooky, I don't mean to scare you. It's okay. You're giving us the mystique, like sexy, like vibe right now. I'm like, <laughs> wait, where are you? I'm I'll drive to you cigar, with a face so mask I, I, on. What's good? <laughs> with a cigar. Oh my God. I'm dying <laughs> on the inside on right now. <laughs> so what are you all doing? What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, it's a surprise. Tell tell them. Wow, I was like, wait, somebody's trying to get into the Zoom right now. This is oh, Chris. Chris, Chris is calling. Chris, Chris is calling me. I can't answer his phone call. I'm in this. I'm like, I'm in a podcast. Here's the link, and here, here he is. <laughs> Okay, this okay, is this. incredible, folks. We have Father Kelly, Chris. No, oh my god. Father Wait, why Kelly, did you turn me into a giddy ball little ball lesbian ball. right now? <laughs> 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 well, I'm really proud about the movie that Toe wrote and, and directed and put together. I think uh, it's it's really been uh, well received and noticed, and I'm really happy about that. You did an incredible job, and we were actually talking about the part of Father Kelly and you know, you still were doing the damn thing and supporting gay marriage. And, you know, you had the secretary, you know, you even married the secretary of the church. How was it to play the part of father Kelly? Um, well, I mean, you know, um, being in the church. And it's also, if, when you think about it, the timing of this, that uh, what toes written with the church now coming around the way it has, uh, to to have to deal with uh, same sex marriages in a way that they never had to deal with it before, and I think uh, they've been up against the wall a lot with their own problems um, that have come to uh, you know light. And but this this is something that's good. I think they've had to accept that they are uh, they've got a they've got to open their heart. Because the most important line in the movie to me is love is love, you know, and if anybody should know that it's the church. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, so that's a that's a long time coming for them uh, to uh, accept that. So it was uh, it was great to have that um, problem in in the in the text that I think he was a man of, of his heart because of his relationship. And um, and with the girls and and that he was, but also being a man of the cloth, he um, was, you know, like a lot of people in organizations, um, didn't always wasn't always able to speak the truth of of who he really was because of some institutions become more important than the, I, the essential idea of that institution, because the essential idea of church and Jesus is exactly what, you know, that line means. If anybody could have said that it would have been Jesus Christ, you know, mm -hmm. um, love is love, no matter how, what form a man and a man, a woman and a woman, a man and a woman, you know, and I think that we're, we still are grappling with that in our country, obviously. But um, I was happy to uh, be a part of something that gave a voice to that, especially within the story of Christmas, right? So that's what I thought it was special. Absolutely. I, you know, I think this film is going to live beyond Christmas, beyond the holidays. It's really a true LGBTQ plus film yeah. creation that's that really sets the tone you know I, mean, listen, my, my... I was really happy when the new york times which um um 
you know, there were a lot of Christmas movies and a couple were, 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 um, exploring those avenues of LBGQ and, and, you know, gay marriage, but they basically, this little movie with no money and no time shot in August in the middle of summer in Brooklyn, um, they, I, one of them said this movie had got more to the heart of the matter than all these other well-funded, you know, TV uh, movies. So uh, that's that's a big uh, that's really due to Toe, um, Toe J, uh, and his uh, passion and his commitment. Absolutely, so. and you know, and, and and church and religion tend to play a really big part, whether the LGBTQ plus community want to speak about it or not, it tends to be a very gray, difficult area to discuss those, those feelings. And, you know, Otage and I, where we were speaking of, you know, my wife and I, we ended up getting married in July, but her mom ended up not coming because of religious reasons. Mm -hmm. Being Mm -hmm. father Kelly, what did that mean for you to be, the the priest in a Christmas wedding. Well, like I say, um, I um, I in, in, enjoyed acting the conflict that he had. I mean, there was something really to deal with there. You, do you go with your heart or your mind? Um, you know, um, it's interesting in to what you know you read a lot today about what uh, Christians and then, and there are many different facets of Christianity in this country, obviously, but the, um, what are they, what, what's the name they call them? The, uh, Ava, uh, Ava, Evangel- uh the evangelical, the evangel- 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 Christians mm-hmm. who have mm-hmm. tied themselves to Trump. Right. And, and then, you know, the question is, well, why are you accepting that from him? What are you getting back from it in terms of um, what your core beliefs of what a a religious life is? And um, it's not the same, it's it's not the same dynamic, but still there is that, um, there is that point where you have to stand up as a human being and say, um, certain values, human values are more important than what the institution demands of me or politically or otherwise. And um, I think that's where sort of a crisis of conscience comes in with a lot of Catholics. I was brought up a Catholic, so, um, and I've always had a sort of uh, lover's quarrel with the church, (laughs) so to speak. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, sometimes I, 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 I always I always say because Chris and I you know we talk a lot a lot of different days I, and I, we talk on Sundays I'm like yeah I'm at church he's like we should go sometime you know <laughs> and, uh, and no but but he really means it Chris is a very spiritual person but when this role was provided and he read it and he really again knowing that I was going to present it to him it had to be something that was more more serious than just like a typical role and. He, because of I knew his spiritual. Well, what, and also what attracted me was the way Toe had me talking to my brethren in a way that, um, you know, every time I go to church and I just sometimes feel you, I'm being lectured at in a sort of dogmatic way that, and it doesn't reach me, you know, it's, it's just, I've heard it before and it, it doesn't, I don't know. And I really felt what was written in this is like, finally, someone had said, this has got to stop this centuries of guilt, you know, that this man stood up and said this, whatever the church says or demands or says we, you can or cannot do, this has got to stop. It's, it's Mm -hmm. just handing down the sins of our forefathers and ideas that are long overdue to be examined and, and cast away. So uh, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was great in that way for me to be able to be a part of that. And also when we, when we filmed, there was a lot of thunderstorms and we thought, wow, this is, this is like a, this is, <laughs> this is a moment when <laughs> Chris is telling love is love and then there's big thunderstorms happening. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, listen, the church that we did it, the church we did it in was very nervous about us doing it too. They were like, we don't want to piss off our, 
our people. So uh, don't go around telling people you're doing this here. <laughs> <laughs> How, but, you know, uh, I, I, I feel like it's fair to say that both of you are allies, you know, and, and, and Father Kelly being one that just didn't give a fuck. He was about that life and he was about love is love. And he continued as, you know, whether his position was in jeopardy or not. Um, what do you say to those folks that, that try to use religion as a way to not support love is love as well as how can allies do better? I don't know. Toe, what do you say? Yeah, I, 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 I said, <laughs> I say that, when people who are questioning love is love, that love, there's no gender to love. There's no age to love, as we all know as well. There's no, there's something where love is, love is beyond specifics. People can't explain love. They try to, they, they explain it where like I said, love is patient, love is kind, love is different things they kind of have in like Bible verses. But in the end, love is a strong connection. And because of that, if people have that connection with so be it like the opposite sex and they have the same connection, maybe strong with the same sex, that can't be denied or ignored. It's still a love connection. And I, that's, that's the hard part because people are feeling love with different people, but it's hard to explain it when you see it. If you see it from an observer, or if you feel it, you know it's love. And I think people that are ignoring the idea of people getting married who are same sex, they just aren't open to realizing that love is something that's unknown to them in a way, because for me, for me, as I've seen, because of being in this film business, I'm seeing different people experience love. And I mean, I'm an athlete growing up, but I've seen people love in a certain way. I've never thought I'll see before until I open my eyes, you know? And I think a lot of people who are kind of restricted to the idea of other people, people loving each other in a certain way, they need to open their eyes and see that this, some people may have a true love because they're fighting for more love and still staying together and this was just saying, this is my husband, this is my wife, and we have a terrible marriage, but we're together, we have kids, and we, we're happy. Bullshit. There's some people who are really fighting for love and living a happy life when they go outside, so it would be interracial love, too. That's another type of love that people question, interracial love. We all deal with that. We all know what that is as well. So love is something that doesn't have a gender or a face. It's just a connection, and that's love. Yeah, and it's, you know, I think, it has a lot to do with conditioning over the years, a conditioning of ideas and prejudices. And if some of these people actually personally got to know the people that they were denying, you know, and actually had human contact and got to know the people, they would say, well, yeah, why, why should we, why should you not have um, marriage? Um, because, if they don't know the people, they fall back on ideas, right? That are agreed upon ideas and conditioning that, that, that sort of makes them self-righteous in their decision to say, well, that's a sin. But if they actually took the chance to get to know the human beings involved, then I think that kind of conditioning falls away. And that's, mm -hmm. um, that, I think that's what's happening as time goes on. Yeah. I got to go put my kid to bed. Um, okay. <laughs> speaking of love. I know. Uh, speaking of love. It, oh, congratulations. Yeah, oh, that's so yeah, fun. Thanks. Yeah. This has I, been I, a pleasant surprise for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I didn't mean to jump in like that, but Toe invited me. So I, I, I wow, figured, thank you, coming. you know, you, I could come in on this. Okay, guys. Thank you, buddy. Um, that great to that talk was to the you. best surprise ever. It was very All nice right, to honey. meet you. I look forward to speaking nice to you to later. <laughs> okay, hon. Be well. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. I was not ready for that. I know. I, I, the whole time, I'm like, he's calling me. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm here doing this. Here, come in. <laughs> it's also because I know for a fact is that, you know, you will handle it well. So it's like, I'm happy that yeah. he really does that. But he came on board and I'm happy that. I mean, again, I can speak about Father Kelly, but what better person than him? Yeah, what other better person to speak of Father Kelly than Father Kelly himself? That, you know, I've, as you can see, I've done an immense research and yeah, he yeah. very rarely jumps on a call with you. And that was, 
Yeah. That was um, incredible for him to just join us for that brief moment. That was really a beautiful thing because that, that speaks to so many different levels, you know, his, his loyalty to you, his, um, his level of love, mm -hmm, his level of love and support of the project and the LGBTQ plus community. Um, Y'all, if y'all didn't put that together, that's Mr. Biggs from Sex yeah. in the City. I'm if so y'all happy. are sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy you didn't, you didn't ask about the, the HBO Max series. No, we got better things to talk about. We got yeah, a, they, a New York, <laughs> New York Christmas message, wedding. That's what we got to talk about. We could yeah. talk about that in the next, you know, if we speak again. But yeah. I understand what it is. And, and he did an incredible job of... Yeah honing in Father Kelly and everything that it meant to be Father Kelly because it's so important to have that outlet, that that person, especially in the religious realm, in the church realm, that you can connect with that understands and is loving in your struggle and your plight, you know? Yeah. <laughs> the secretary had their gay... I still can't get over the secretary and her gay wedding. She's like, ah, he's been kicked out. He's been excommunicated, but he married us, you know. (laughs) That was such a beautiful come to life, come to circle, um, you know, moment. And there were so many things that folks probably missed when they were watching the film. Um, Do you do you you, do you you think did you know where the ending what the ending was going to be where she would decide to go back? Did you have no. No, yeah. I really like, didn't. I was like, oh, shit, is she going to go back in the closet now that she knows her life, you know, or what? It, no. what is she going to do? I didn't I didn't have the slightest because when she came back to life to like yeah. her actual present, I was like, this can go in a million different ways. Yeah. And I liked that I didn't know. Okay. I like that. You know, I hate when I can guess. Yep. where it goes and then it actually goes that way but i was like i don't know where this is gonna go i was getting stressed out i was like what's jennifer had, gonna do yeah, that anxiety people don't like to <laughs> feel but some people who guess stories and they're they're surprised by the ending they're kind of like i haven't felt in a long time it's a wild ride you know what i mean but some yeah. people they, 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 they it's uncomfortable for them not, not to know what's going to happen but some people that's kind of like, this is what film should be. They experience, you know, you're living in this world for 90 minutes and you don't know the ending and you're going to see it through yeah. and see what happens. And that was, that, that's yeah. almost a little bit what Jitters did for me as well is kind of like, you have a film, you tell a story this way, you go that way, but you get back to this mm-hmm. way. But going that yeah. way, what happens a lot with filmmakers, they never get back here. They go here, they go like that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. get back, go here and come back there, but still that's where the true type of storytelling is really what you want to do because people are following you, but you, you, yeah. you can go a little bit off trap, but come back to the whole theme of the story. And I think for this film and the experience is like, what's going to happen. It's like a safe landing. It's like, Oh, it's rocky, it's rocky, it's rocky, mm-hmm. it's rocky. Then it's all, it's a safe landing and we're gone. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, and you've been, an incredible ally um, to the community as a, as a storyteller, as a creative, as everything. What can other allies uh, keep in mind and what can they do better? How can they be better allies? Well, I mean, thank you for saying that. I I, I just think I'm, I'm just doing what I can, what's offered for me to kind of just keep on, telling stories that haven't been seen before. You know, there are a lot of people that say, um, you know, tell a story that's not about that, more about you, but it's kind of like, yeah, but stories about me and my, who I am, not about me personally, but the idea of me, they've been done before 12 different times. Mm-hmm. Like a story like this showing, I mean, there's so many queer love stories that haven't been told because there's some queer stories that we're trying to like hit a home run and have it be like the queer love story. But it's also, there's some queer love stories that they could just be simple stories and not have, not having to be the label. Like I said before, not be labeled queer stories. They're just mm-hmm. simple stories with two queer leads, you know? And I think as an independent filmmaker where I'm at right now, 
I'm just always going for films and stories that haven't been told before because that's what yeah. that's all I have basically you know I yeah. you, 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 you can't again you're gonna see films for the past for the past decades on end you're gonna see films that have been retold 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 but if you go if anyone I mean big time Hollywood stars or anyone else they'd be like Is, was there ever a gay angel in the film Cooper Cox was first for history, yeah. I mean that little. That, I mean that that's film history. Cooper Cox was first. Was there ever like um, uh, a diverse lead in a in a queer love story for Christmas? Nia Fairweather was first. You know, I mean that's history, and I think I want to kind of lean towards that. And I think allies who are allies instead of just standing on a parade float in June, you know, <laughs> you're yeah. an artist. Write songs, write songs. Might well, not write songs, but just express your art. I'd say write songs because I love music, but write songs, tell your art. I mean, express your own story in these type of love stories that you're supporting. Yeah. Write a write, write a write, write an art piece about being an ally. What does that look like? Mm. You know, this is my way of being an ally. I'm not just saying, hey, I support because that's nice for like 30 days in June, but what about literally spending 18 months of your life creating a story that known for a fact there are people out there that's saying you're an ally who are you who are you to tell the story and i'm saying i'm an ally i'm telling the story because no one else will tell the story be that person yeah. you know that's what it's about that's what it's about being being someone that's going to invest your time and your life into telling the story as an ally rather than just putting up a flag on your back of your car Hmm. yeah that's so true. But, 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 but we love the flag in the back of the car because it adds to the storytelling. So it's good. <laughs> yeah. Listen, this has been a, such an incredible night. And thank you so much. It was just so beautifully done. Thank I've you. never, I, and I love, and <clears throat> in one of those previous episodes where I talk about, and I completely butchered your name, by the way. So if you ever go back to, 62, I, episode 62, I'm going to go back because I want to hear you talk yeah, about the film without, without knowing was, me. Uh, yeah, you, like, yeah. I, and I totally, you know, I butchered your name because I was so excited about the film. I didn't even, and I normally, as you can see, I like to do my research, good, but I was good. so excited and so pumped up about the film and speaking about it while it was fresh in my heart. I was like, I need to figure out the pronunciation, but I'm going to do my best <laughs> of trying to pronunciate that. But I, I already knew. I was like, in my heart, that can't be the pronunciation. Like, I fucked it up completely. But I was so pumped up about the beautiful uh, projection and, and, like, feel of that film. I've never, and I love watching gay shit. Yeah. I love watching <laughs> gay movies. My wife and I, we love watching gay movies, gay, gay shows, anything gay. We try to watch it just because we want to see it and we want to support. But what can we expect from you? Um, that was such a beautifully done film. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, our production company, Willful Productions, we did a music video after this, after this film. It was called uh, Strong, Strong, Strong. It was by Queen V. Um, it's on our channels. And um, we, sh we shot it and produced it during the pandemic. So I'm very proud of that. My first ever music video. Again, this is my, Jitters was first. And New York Christmas Wedding was my second, my first feature film. And Strong, my first music video. So I'm developing my slate and willful slate. And I'm really enjoying the idea of, seeing that when I'm creating these projects, you're seeing me in them. You're seeing me as a filmmaker in them because there's that type of, it's my heart more or less, you know, it's my idea of things. So from that, I'm going back to writing. I was literally in the Christmas world for 18 months. We finished press. This, 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 I think this may be the last interview I'm doing about this film, which is great. And I'm happy. And I, and I, I know nice. more, will come, more will come around come, 2021 November because I do believe <laughs> it will live on for for a couple of more years because I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who've seen it right away they liked it they have strong reservations but I think also people still people will kind of revisit this film because it's fun it's enjoyable 
But right now it's going back to writing and developing more projects. I, I definitely want to expand more on my jitters type of a uh, theme because I think as a short, it's a perfect representation of what I can do that people could take in right away. But this film as a feature film is, is, you sh- is showing people that even with the tight budget, I was, still la- I, was, I was still able to deliver a story that was written and produced in a way of like, this is what we can do with what we have. And there's some people out there who would see this and think, oh, this looks like, why did they have this? You know, it's a low budget film. But there are people like yourself who know story, who see many different stories about like, like high budget type of queer films. And yet it doesn't really hit in the way ours did because ours was hit because it was in a, it was more in like a personal and more effective way. Yeah. So I'm just hoping to keep on creating and keep on working. You know, it, it's for me, it's just doing the work, you know, having someone like Chris Noth involved and supportive, supportive people are watching our film and I'll keep on writing more roles for people like Chris because he's someone who, you know, he's someone who believes in me and I'm very grateful that he supported me in this journey and I want to keep on making people proud and more than anything, make my mother proud. So I want to keep on going. Yeah, I love that. This has been incredible and this has been completely an honor Um, for folks that haven't watched. Make sure you check out Jitters on Amazon and make sure you check out um, a a New York Christmas wedding uh, on Netflix. These are both films that you. Yeah. ah, I'm going to drink straight from the bottle, too. Ah. There we go. There you go. Mm. There we go. Make sure you check out those films. Those are films that you need to have in your life. I'm not giving you an option. You need to have it in your life. This has been a complete honor and a pleasure. Um, Before we um, end every episode, and we've had so much fun. We didn't even need play story time. We've just been playing keywords and getting hella like lit and buzz. So (laughs) it is what it is. (laughs) It's all good. So before we get out of here, we usually end on a words of wisdom. What would be your words of wisdom uh, that you would leave the people with? I would love to say that um, during that, during right now, as we're coming to the, not the end, but we're, we're rolling down the hill of the pandemic. Just be sure to be kind and spread love to your, to the next person. Not your neighbor, because in the end, your neighbor, people still don't talk to them. But the next person, so be it someone online, to be as someone that you see in school, to be someone that you know in conversation, to spread love. I appreciate you taking the time. Jam um, pack. I love you, jam pack. Let's keep on going. Yeah. Again, folks. Check out Jitters. Check out a, a Christmas New York wedding, a New York Christmas wedding. I always like to mix it up. A New York Christmas wedding. Make sure you check it out. Make sure you check out Stonewall. Check everything out. You're doing yeah. incredible work. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave the people with? Is there a project that we can expect that you're yeah, that well, we can we, look we out have, for? We have, yeah, we have two more music videos on Willful Productions. We have our Kelsey Madsen, who sung the end credit song. The Bells of Christmas Day. We have a video on YouTube and also um, Make a Toast a song on YouTube. And she's a phenomenal singer. And from that, just keep on following Willful Productions. We're, we're developing things. And I truly believe I'm still in the independent spirit and I'll get there and I will get there very, very soon. But, you know, right now it's just keep on creating the work to keep on growing. So I'm very happy to people like yourself and your audience that are going to be part of this journey because we're going to get there. Definitely. I truly believe that. We on it. We on it. We go together now. Yes. exactly. <laughs> Respectfully. And we've connected with you now, you know, we, oh, we, grateful. thank you so much. We've connected with you on so many different levels. Same for sure. Definitely. I'll be listening. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Real life and no TV. Millionaires stay greedy. No love and there's no grub. We got the homeless saying. Y'all better come my way. Y'all better come my way. Okay, you say. Y'all better come my way. I'ma make a statement day by day. Y'all better come my way. Y'all better come my way. Okay, you say. Y'all better come my way. I'ma make a statement day by day. Y'all better come my way. Y'all better come my way. Okay, you say. Y'all better come my way. I'ma make a statement day by day. Peace out, peace out.